Sorry about that. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Nature Matters for Black Lives. My name is Timothy, and I serve as the Assistant Director of Constituency Engagement here for the NC State Alumni Association. And on behalf of the Alumni Association, the Black Alumni Society, I am thrilled to welcome you all um, to, this, to this event tonight um, as we talk about something that's very important and dear to us in the African-American community. Um, I want you all to know that there is a Q&A feature that you all can use to ask your questions um, for, for our presenter. Um, and we will be sure that those questions get, um, hopefully can get, can get answered in the time that we have allotted here for us today. Um, I just also want to remind you as well that this is being recorded as well. So, um, so if you have to log off for any reason or, you know, technology, happens because technology happens right uh, you, you will be able to go back and view this later on on our youtube channel um and so <clears throat> without further ado um i would like to introduce to you um a wonderful woman, um, our VAS president, um, Ms. Samantha Warren. Um, she's a 2012 graduate of NC State. Um, she got her degree in microbiology, um, <clears throat> in microbiology, a leader within a um, pharma industry for 20 years. She is an inclusion and diversity practitioner at GSK. When she's not at work, she's energized by volunteerism and philanthropy. At the university, Sam is a member of the Chancellor's Act American Community Advisory Council and the president of the NC State Black Alumni Society and a, and a recipient of the university's inaugural Alumni Legacy Award. So without further ado, Samantha Warren. Thank you so much, Timothy. So hello, friends. I'm Samantha Warren, class of 12, the current president of the Black Alumni Society. And like Timothy, I want to welcome you to tonight's program on Nature Matters for Black Lives featuring our very own Dr. Myron Floyd. Um, before we kick off officially, I'd like to share a little bit about Bass and why this talk is, is so important to us. So um, as most of you probably know, Bass was established in 1979 um, with the aim to, to really keep our colleagues connected to our dear alma mater through fellowship and through philanthropy. And like most of the Black alumni at State, as I reflect on my experience with the university, we know that a big part of our uh, success as students was in large part due to the relationships that we had with our faculty and especially our faculty of color. Um, one of my favorite pastimes when I connect with my university peers is to uh, get together and swap stories about the great relationships that we've had with our black faculty and just the immense sense of pride that we all have first of all, because of their brilliant scholarship, but also because of their mentoring and coaching, and most importantly, the connections that we felt with the Black faculty through um, their friendship. And, and I have to say, like, fast forward 42 years, uh, and the mission of VAS is the same, as is our love and reverence uh, for our Black faculty. It still holds true. So this evening, we're in for an absolute treat, as uh, Dr. Floyd chairs a little bit about some of the barriers that black and brown folks face when trying to uh, access nature and what we can do to make sure that green spaces are, are more inclusive for all. So let's give uh, Dr. Floyd a proper vast introduction. So I'll read a little bit about his bio. I hope this gives you a flavor of, uh, of who he is and what he's bringing to our talk tonight. So Dr. Myron F. Floyd currently serves as the Dean of the College of Natural Resources at NC State. He earned his PhD in Recreation and Resources Development from Texas A&M University. He earned his MS and BS degrees from Clemson University, specializing in resource management. He first joined the college in 2005 as a professor in the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management and served as director of graduate programs for the department from 2010 to 2014. Dr. Floyd was appointed interim dean of the College of Natural Resources in August of 2019, and he was appointed to the head of the Department of Parks, Recreation and Tourism Management in March 2020, and then as dean in the spring of 2020. Prior to joining uh, NC State, 
Dr. Floyd served on the faculty at Clemson University, Texas A&M, and the University of Florida. Uh, Dean Floyd is widely recognized as a leading scholar focused on understanding race and ethnic patterns and outdoor recreation behavior. His most recent research, which we'll hear about some tonight, examines how public parks and green spaces and other features of the built environment contribute to physical activity in low-income communities of color. Dr. Floyd is the co-author of Race, Ethnicity, and Leisure, Perspectives on Research, Theory, and Practice from Human Kinetics, and is widely published with 95 peer-reviewed journals, uh, journal articles, excuse me, 22 peer-reviewed monographs and proceedings papers, 18 book chapters, and over 100 presentation papers and abstracts. In 2008, Dr. Floyd was awarded the Theodore and Franklin Roosevelt Award, the highest award for research excellence from the National Recreation and Park Association. He was also recently appointed to the North Face um, Explore Fund Council, a program that is devoted to diversity and equity and inclusion efforts that will expand access for all to outdoor exploration. So again, I hope that this has given you just a little flavor of Dr. Floyd's uh, scholarship and please join me in welcoming him to our virtual stage. Welcome, Dr. Floyd Bass and friends. We're here and honored to hear from you this evening. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the warm welcome to Bass. You're and welcome. I want to, want to thank you and thank the um, the Society and the North Carolina State Alumni Association for hosting me tonight and allowing me to have this opportunity and this privilege to share with you and to, I'll say, also to get to know you and you to get to know me a little. And so I'm looking forward to that. Um, we have a straightforward plan tonight, and I do want to start with just some highlights from the College of Natural Resources, or CNR as we often call it. And I do want to highlight some of our faculty of color, some of our African-American faculty that uh, Sam just mentioned and how important they are to our students. I mean, to all of our students, but particularly to our students of color, just to share a brief bit about um, what they do for us and how they contribute to the mission of NC State and our, and our college. And there will be another quick word about me, um, a little bit about my background and my research, but then I want to um, address the title for this evening, Nature Matters for Black Lives, and, um, and see where that takes us um, to the end and hopefully have some questions and answers and some discussion at the end. But starting with our college, just a, just a brief snapshot, and just basically this is by the numbers. Um, you know, we are a relatively small community on the NC State campus. Um, we have roughly 1,400 undergraduate students, uh, about 400 um, graduate students. And so um, puts us about 1,800 um, in terms of our student population. Within our community, we have 220 faculty and staff. We have three academic departments, as I'll mention in just a moment. And across those three departments, there are nine different uh, majors. So we have a quite a, a diverse offering under the broad umbrella of CNR or the College of Natural Resources. College Factual ranks our college number four in the nation for one of the best places to study conservation and natural resources. And we are certainly proud of that ranking. And uh, given what I see every day in this college, I can understand why we have been designated in that way. As I mentioned, we have three departments in the college. Um, we have forestry, environmental resources, parks, recreation, tourism management. That's my uh, former department where I was department head and director of graduate programs and my discipline. Uh, we also have a department of forest biomaterials. And in that department, we have two components there. There's uh, paper science and engineering and sustainable um, materials technology. Within our college, we also house an interdisciplinary center, the Center for Geospatial, Geospatial Analytics. And within the center, there are three academic programs, the PhD, a Master's of Geospatial Information Tech and Technology, as well as a Master's Certificate in Geospatial Information Science and Technology. 
So we're proud of all these programs. And as you saw the ranking, we, we are um, very proud of all the work that our faculty, staff, and students do uh, day in and day out. As mentioned, I do want to highlight some of the um, some of our faculty and some of the leadership in the College of Natural Resources. I will start with introducing um, Dr. Stacy Nelson. Um, Stacy is a professor in the Department of Forestry and Environmental Resources, and he is also um, our interim associate dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the college. Uh, this is the first, um, actually, Dr. Nelson is the first to hold that position. And the associate dean in DEI is the first of its kind on the NC State campus. Stacy has provided uh, strong leadership over the past year. And just one quick example of that, um, last year he was instrumental in establishing the Dyer series, our uh, diversity seminar series in which we invite industry leaders, experts in DEI, alumni and alumni to share their perspectives on diversity, equity and inclusion to help the CNR community learn and grow um, and improve uh, the climate within our college. I also wanna highlight another colleague, Dr. Louis Rivers um, and I, I might get into a little trouble in that I'm highlighting one department, but believe me, this is widespread across our college. But uh, Dr. Louis Rivers uh, specializes in risk perception and decision-making processes and those mechanisms in minority and underserved communities. And I highlight uh, Dr. Rivers because of his interest in promoting and studying environmental justice. And one uh, particular project, he is examining how upstream runoff in Wake County that is accelerated by urban development, how that impacts communities downstream in Southeast Raleigh and those areas that in those areas, there are mostly African-American and lower wealth communities. In addition to that, um, Louis works with a number of community partners as a part of the Walnut Creek Wetland Community Partnership to raise awareness about environmental justice and to identify and implement projects that mitigate flooding, such as rain gardens being uh, planted, as you see on the right, as well as educational programs to inform the community and make them um, to raise awareness about environmental justice issues and the importance of healthy wetlands and, and the overall healthy communities. And the final faculty spotlight is uh, Dr. Zakia Leggett, um, whose expertise is in soil ecology. And I highlight uh, Dr. Leggett because of her leadership um, with the Doris Duke Conservation Scholars Program. She is the program leader for that. That's a national program. It's a program that um, provides a two-year experiential training program for undergraduate students interested in conservation, but also interested in diversity and who we see high potential, a strong potential to be leaders, uh, the next leaders within the conservation arena. This is open to all students. Um, the students uh, again receive a stipend. Uh, I'm not sure if I said that, but they do receive a stipend over two summers. They engage in uh, research alongside their professors and mentors, as well as seasoned conservation practitioners and professionals. They have their opportunity to, to go out into the field, as you see, do research, uh, collect data, as well as get practice in presenting their data and results to, um, to uh, different workshops and conferences, and also to build a network uh, within the profession. So we are very happy and very proud of the work that um, both Dr. Leggett and Rivers and the leadership that uh, Dr. Nelson provides for the College of Natural Resources. So a little about me, I'm not gonna say much given the introduction and you can go to the website and look at the bio and, this, and my CV and all that. Um, but I do wanna emphasize that for the College of Natural Resources, I am a rather unconventional Dean. 
And it's not so obvious, but it might be obvious if you knew more about the field of natural resources. Um, and what is unconventional is that I am the first social scientist and the first social scientist with an outdoor recreation background. And being the ninth dean of the college, um, that, that is what makes me somewhat unconventional among some other obvious, um, I'll just say characteristics. But again, it's been my honor to lead the college and it's really been gratifying uh, with all this happened over the past year to work with the students, the staff and the faculty um, to keep the college moving ahead and making the contributions that we make. So to get to the theme tonight, um, I really wanna address uh, the central questions that drive my research, uh, which uh, has driven my research over the past, I would say 30 years or so. It's not gonna to be too much in the weeds or too much detail, but just wanna address these broad questions as it relates to the topic. Um, one is to kind of highlight the importance of nature to help among black Americans, but also to deal with the question of who has access to nature and as a part of that question and ask why. And then toward the end ask, how do we make it more accessible to a broader and more diverse audience. First, starting with some of the benefits of nature, and this is just a short list, but research is increasing that shows uh, just a, a huge catalog or just a huge inventory of benefits associated with contact with nature through recreation, through just everyday nature in our neighborhoods and even in our backyards. Nature is, has been shown to lower risk of a variety of cardiovascular diseases, lower risk of obesity and overweight, diabetes, and mental distress, um, even been shown to lower risk of premature mortality. In other words, it can help us live longer. It also has been shown to um, just make people feel better and their self-reported health improves. And again, a range of things related to our mental and uh, our mental and cognitive health. And things that you may not even be aware of, things like birth outcomes improve in our cognitive functioning, particularly among older adults. So getting outdoors can lead to a better health and healthier lives. One of the things that we saw with the COVID-19 pandemic is that it showed or it put a spotlight on racial health disparities in our country where people of color had higher rates of infections, hospitalizations and death due to COVID. And this was associated with underlying health conditions and underlying health disparities. And some examples are on the screen. Um, and the first one that um, black Americans compared to whites are less likely to be insured. Obesity and overweight has been associated with COVID uh, morbidity and mortality and 80% of African-American women were obese. 42% of African-Americans suffer from high, hypertension compared to just 29% of Hispanic whites. And African-Americans have the highest mortality rates um, for all forms of cancer. So the question about does nature matter for black lives is not an insignificant question or an insignificant statement. Um, these uh, statistics suggest that this is an important question for us to examine in terms of it's important for African Americans specifically. So do African Americans value nature for health is one way we can get into looking at some of the uh, issues involved. Um, and um, I, I don't think this is su surprising, um, but it might be surprising to some. But um, there is strong evidence that most African Americans, um, when asked how important is getting outdoors into nature for helping your physical health, that over two thirds report that it is highly important. And this comes from a very large study um, by DJ Case, a reputable survey firm. And I want to say this sample is over 17,000 individuals. Oh, excuse me, the entire sample. Excuse me, it's right there on the screen, I'm so sorry. 5,459 adults 
18 and over. So that's a very good sample and very solid evidence to support that, um, that statement and to answer that question. Interestingly, when we look at, diff, look at that in comparison to other racial and ethnic groups, that's, um, I would say it's about the same. All groups uh, that's shown here uh, rate getting out into the outdoors for health um, as highly important. So there's not much different th difference there between racial and ethnic groups as measured in this survey. And that's good news. And on the other hand, if we start to look at participation or active engagement in terms of what people actually do, survey research from the National Park Service, uh, and this is a house school survey, when, when they asked individuals, did they visit a national park in the last two years, we see that a higher proportion of white in this particular sample and Asian Americans, 53% uh, of those households said yes, but for Black, and Hispanic Americans, as measured in this survey, um, were toward the lower end or the lowest uh, percentages, with Black being the lowest at 28%. So again, there's a kind of disparity between interest and actual participation in um, national park visitation. A similar pattern we find can be found in data from the US Forest Service. And these are data from actual visits to national forest on-site surveys, going to a particular forest and uh, surveying people on-site. And for this one, um, I don't know how many of you remember Pac-Man, but this is kind of what you see and that you have this large um, representation among non-Hispanic whites, 97%, with the rest of that pie that's kind of um, it, out to the right there. Uh, with the um, racial and ethnic minority groups composing about 3% of those four different um, slivers. So again, um, large disparity between interest and um, actual participation in these kinds of activities. But there is a caveat in that we're only looking here at national park visits and US forest visits but it does help to make a point as we launch into this. And that is, um, you know, why do those gaps exist? Um, you know, who has access to nature and why and, and, and why? We could venture a few reasons like income, family traditions, uh, safety, historical discrimination. We'll come back to those latter two in just a moment. But these are important questions to ask, as I mentioned earlier. Um, as it relates to health disparities and the importance of that to, um, to African-Americans. We know from recent events and from history that gaining access to nature can be complicated for African-Americans. And what do I mean by that? Let's look at a few examples and I think the uh, picture will become clear. Um, this is a, an individual you may have seen in the news last year. Um, I, don't, I do not know this individual, but I, he became something of, um, I won't say a celebrity, but it was uh, a story that ran quite a bit last year in the, um, based out of New York, Christian Cooper, who was an African-American bird watcher, was in New York Central Park and was accused of threatening a, uh, a white woman uh, dog owner because she refused to put her dog on a leash and um, uh, she proceeded to um, take a picture of him and call the police and she was uh, re recorded saying that uh, she was going to tell the police that an African-American man was threatening her life. I think we were all, many of us or most of us have, were, are aware of that particular story. This is one you may not be as familiar with. Um, Rahawa Haley um, is a writer and she undertook a hike of the Appalachian Trail from its beginning in Georgia up to its end in Maine. Um, 
And she had an interesting story that she wrote about in Outside Magazine. And she recalled being stopped by a, a hiker, a day hiker, someone who was hiking for the day during this trip. This is from Maine to Georgia. This, this is a long hike. And uh, he asked her where she was from. And finding that her response that she was from Miami not sufficient, he asked her where was she really from? <laughs> and when she was disclosed that she was originally from Eritrea, or at least that was her, her roots, her family roots, the hiker was somehow relieved to learn that she wasn't really black. And the quote that she gave, he said that you're African, you're not black black, because blacks don't hike. So again, um, access to nature can get a little complicated for some of us. And uh, one uh, final um, one is uh, from Juan Porter, um, who was hiking in the Katahdin, um, in Katahdin in Maine Baxter State Park. Uh, if you read any of Thoreau's work, Katahdin is uh, uh, part of his story. But three white women began to speak loudly as they approached him from behind on a trail so as to alert anyone that, um, that a threat was about to enter their space. In other words, they began to talk really loud and, um, and uh, basically they said, uh, quote, you surprised us. We did not expect to see you. Um, and just wanna just make that point about they did not expect to see him. And you know, this makes the point that uh, you know, these kinds of interactions in the outdoors um, for African-Americans and other people of color, as I said before, can be complicated in that they can result in diminished recreation experiences and by answering a few awkward questions, or in the case, some cases, they can um, lead to perceptions of lack of safety, or it could result in injury. And in the extreme case, there can be a loss of life. But in, but in one, two of these cases, we have situations where people are being defined by others as who belongs where and when. And basically, we could say that these are white spaces that Black people have somehow um, have invaded uh, from, one, from one point of view. And there's something we've also uncovered in some of our research uh, as we conduct, um, as we have conducted some focus groups for the National Park Service. And this is just a statement from one participant from, an inter from a focus group in 2018. And this is speaking of national parks in general. But she said that those places haven't been safe spaces for people of color historically, number one. And this is a conversation about spaces, who's allowed and who's not allowed. And again, um, having to negotiate um, what some might call a white space, what some might call an unsafe space uh, based on what could happen in those particular areas. And that's, um, I won't say that's an exaggeration given what we've seen recently far too frequently. So there is a history of the outdoors not being exclusive um, beyond what we see in the present day. And I think most of us know this. Um, that there is this history of exclusion and sanction, segregation, and uh, Jim Crow. And it not only have impacted the, our education and other commercial um, sectors, but it was also um, enforced in public parks and other outdoor areas. From this state paper here from South Carolina, um, park closed when um, black people were entering. That was a strategy, I believe, to, um, to keep them out, but as well as other um, examples from around the South. And I guess this was the case around the country. But there is that also to contend with as we think about who has access to nature and why. But then it also has to make us think about, well, how do we make it more accessible if we're thinking about redefining that space and making that space more inclusive. And um, I'll just say reclaiming that space to borrow words from uh, Carolyn Finney, who has written about this and I really um, recommend this book if you're interested in following up. 
Um, but you know, it's, as, as I said, it's important to keep in mind that African-Americans were systematically excluded from these places. However, um, throughout history, African-Americans have created a culture to survive oppression and exclusion. And um, according to Finney, this gives African-Americans an opportunity to, to reclaim space and to recreate it to accommodate the kind of use that, um, that African-Americans and other people of color would like to uh, engage in. And that's this part of the quote that's highlighted that to construct environmental spaces in our own image. And I think that is something that many groups are taking to heart as we think about how to diversify the outdoors, how to expand access and, um, and just how to make these spaces more welcoming um, as, a, as a bottom line. So what does this look like or what can this look like? We have both historical and contemporary manifestations of what it means to reclaim and what it means to reaffirm and what it means to construct environmental spaces um, in our own image to borrow her, her words. So one way we can look at this and for examples is we can look up just back at history and, uh, and see that from the reconstruction era through the Jim Crow era that African-Americans have cultivated relationships with nature they have done what, what Finney um, spoke about, reclaiming space, making their own space, and sought out nature-based leisure experiences and travel destinations, such as places like historic Idlewild um, and other places where African-Americans, because of segregation, had to uh, develop their own travel infrastructure, their own hotels, resorts, restaurants, travel guides, and so forth. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the Green Book, which would be an example of, of how African-Americans coped with, um, with the Jim Crow um, oppression and um, um, in order to engage in these kinds of activities. And then there are others. This is also from, from Ida Wild. But again, making the point that, um, that, that despite oppression, that African-Americans persist, persisted and found ways to engage in outdoor spaces um, for their own restoration and, and, and recreation and socializing and community. Um, if you're my age, I, want, I guess I can give you my age. I am 61 this year. And if you're about my age, and if you grew up in the South, you probably visited a segregated beach. And that was where you went to the beach. If you're from South Carolina, you went to Atlantic Beach, but there are a number of um, black, beaches, black beaches and resorts around the country. And uh, this is dated 2019, but I think I saw this morning, there's an updated one for 2021, black beaches to visit this summer. But again, um, places were developed, spaces were created for black recreation. And one, uh, uh, one that uh, has, um, is one I'll just highlight, American Beach in, uh, in Florida, founded by Abraham Lewis, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, uh, who was the founder of the Afro-American Insurance Company. He purchased 200 acres of uh, beachfront property for his employees because they were not allowed in other Florida beaches. And this turned into a major destination for African-Americans in the 19, uh, in the Jim Crow era, well into the 50s. And I stated earlier, segregation required that African-Americans develop their own travel infrastructure. And his slogan, and which also speaks to this, that you know, he wanted to provide recreation and relaxation without the, without the humiliation. And interestingly, we see similar kinds of um, activities of movements in the modern um, day, or just say in, in the present day, and um, where community organizations, individuals have taken it upon themselves to, I guess, to point to new directions and being very creative 
in introducing and expanding, introducing people to the outdoors, diverse people to the outdoors and expanding access. And one I'll just uh, start off with is Earl B. Hunter, who I just met maybe a month ago in the parking lot. I don't, we just met and looked, learned that Earl B. Hunter is the founder and president of a group of a company called Black Folks, Black Folks Camp 2. Uh, Earl is doing great work. He is a former salesperson for the Sylvan Motorsports Company. I think if I have that right, they sold campers. And that's how he got into the business. And he's in it now to expand access to camping and outdoor activities for a broader segment of the population, focusing primarily on African-Americans, but everyone. Um, and I encourage you to uh, Google him and look at some of the things that he's doing. This is another way, uh, another example of how the face of outdoor recreation is changing. And these are the ebony anglers who, uh, who embrace the competitive sport uh, competitive, competitive sport fishing. And in 20, I want to say this was 2018, it might've been 2018, I think, that they took first, first place in a King Mackerel division of the Spanish Mackerel and Dolphin Tournament, catching a 48 pound King Mackerel. And they were featured in these um, media outlets, uh, Today Show, New York Times and others. But again, speaking to the idea that there can be diversity and them taking this on and um, self, mostly self-organizing, but, but bringing just a different um, um, approach to uh, outdoor recreation, bringing their, their culture and, um, and not only their culture, but also other women into this um, a sport that's primarily, that has been primarily male and white. And many of you might be familiar with Outdoor Afro. Um, which is an organization probably maybe the, perhaps the most well-known uh, for engaging African-Americans in the outdoors. Um, they have a network that expands across the United States uh, with more than 80 um, leaders. And it's on the website, it says in 42 cities around the country. And they provide um, opportunities for um, individuals, groups, families to get outside and to be um, engaged in nature and, and also be engaged in this movement to expand um, access to the outdoors and engage folks in conservation and conservation efforts. And this is another interesting one. Um, this is some, I have not, uh, don't have much familiarity with this group, but I, this is a book that I would also recommend. Um, James Mills, the author of The Adventure Gap, he chronicles an expedition to um, the first African-American um, ascent of, of uh, Denali. And, um, and this is an amazing um, um, adventure in that this is an all black a climbing team that took this on and basically doing this to inspire others to get into other people of color, to get into outdoor adventure sports and to promote environmental stewardship. And what was mentioned in the introduction is that um, recently I was, and I'm very excited about this, that over the course of the summer, um, I'll be working with the North Face uh, with these other, um, uh, I don't, I'll just call them, some of these are this well-known celebrities, Lena Wade, Jimmy Chen. I don't know what to say. I can't believe I'm in the same, um, on the same uh, website with them. That's me right there. But um, we will be working on creating um, ideas and making recommendations and uh, making grants um, uh, with the um, $7 million there um, to promote uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in the outdoors. Um, looking forward to that, but, but again, it's bringing um, a more diverse set of perspectives to what the outdoors can be and how to engage with a more diverse audience and, and in ways that will uh, be more effective in making that connection. But this will be focused on 
you know, working and partnering with organizations led by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color communities. So why is this in important? Why is this relevant? And I've already talked about health, but I'd also like to point out that outdoor recreation is in the words of the Outdoor Industry Association, it's a powerful economic engine, and there's over $887 billion spent annually in outdoor recreation. That includes everything from travel to equipment to attire and clothing, et cetera. And so that's a huge, huge uh, economic, um, um, it's huge for the economy across the country. And it's also huge for North Carolina, which, uh, Outdoor recreation in North Carolina is about a 12 billion, approximately $12 billion in consumer spending um, in, our, in our state. And secondly, when we look at huge environmental challenges like climate change, it's also going to be important to diversify who an outdoor recreation is, who's engaged in that movement. Um, studies tell us that climate change will cause the most economic harm in the nation's poorest communities and in communities of color. Studies also tell us that poor and minority neighborhoods that were once shaped by discriminatory practices such as redlining and other forms of discrimination have less infrastructure to make them resilient against climate change. For example, having fewer trees, less vegetation, and you saw some of that in the examples uh, from Dr. Louis Rivers, some of the work that he's doing. So it's critical that there is a greater diversity of our population, a greater representation of African-Americans and other people of color uh, and highly engaged in the conservation of our outdoors and in taking on big problems, big challenges like climate change, which is so critical that we do um, address. So the final points here, um, I'll just say just, you know, that, well, the, the title, Nature Matters for Black Lives. Um, it is important um, uh, across the board. Um, and I want, hope I showed that for a long time that um, getting out into the outdoors and that um, this has been important for black people for a long time. And from at the same time, from a public health perspective and an economic perspective, and as a stewardship perspective, uh, we cannot neglect disparities in full access to nature and the outdoors. So it does matter um, for African-Americans, it does matter for all, but it may matter most for those populations that have less access to it and who bear a greater sense, a greater burden rather, of disease and disability. Uh, the second point here is that, you know, we do need to understand that people of color have different experiences um, um, with the outdoors, um, as I mentioned earlier, and we need to understand that to expand access and to increase representation. And there's a need to tell the stories of Black connections to the outdoors. Uh, recently, the coverage of the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre and Black Wall Street that occurred on Black Wall Street showed that many people didn't know that history. And there are numerous opportunities to bring the history of Blacks in the outdoors, the history of Black resorts, the history of Black outdoor recreation participation, et cetera, forward to um, a greater number of people. And I think there's, finally, there's a need to engage directly with organizations representing people of color to expand access to nature. As I mentioned, public agencies like the National Park Service, the US Forest Service, state park agencies, brands like REI, the North Face. Um, you know, it's important that they connect directly to people of color-led organizations. And why is that the case? Um, it's important that because um, these organizations have important gatekeepers, these individuals have credibility within their professional networks, and they also have authenticity or can be authentic rep representatives uh, of their communities. And as I was trying to say earlier, they come with new ideas about how to connect with diverse audiences. When you bring in people like Lena Wade and Jimmy Chin and the others that are on the screen there with me, um, 
more diverse in terms of their age, uh, they're younger, they um, just bringing fresh new ideas and ways to think about engaging um, people in the outdoors, a diversity of people in the outdoors. So I hope this has been um, somewhat informative. I hope this has been engaging. And I hope that you come away with a sense of why this is an important issue for us as a college, why is this an important issue for the, some of the research that we're engaged in, but also why is it, it's important for our society as we, as we think about um, the role that nature plays in our health and as we think about how to make that accessible to a greater um, segment of our population. So I will end there and hopefully I've left time for a couple of questions um, and some dialogue. Yes, thank you so much, um, Dr. Floyd. We really appreciate your expertise um, and educating us um, about this subject matter. Um, at this time, if anyone has any questions, feel free to use the Q&A feature that's at the bottom of the screen, um, and we will try to get these answered. And so we do have one question that's come in. It said, you mentioned in 2008, results of a comprehensive survey of the American people in visiting national parks. So 2018 results um, just came out. And despite a decade of efforts to increase diversity in the outdoors, the results are pretty much the same. What can public land agencies um, in the NPS do? So the question is, what can the National Park Service do to increase or close the gap? Yes. Well, I think of, you know, part of it is, well, there are a couple, of, well, a number of things. One is to um, promote um, the ways that people are connected to, to parks and the variety of parks that are out there. Um, allowing people to see those, see themselves in those areas. And that's not just historic sites. So for example, I'll just say the MLK historic site, you might think that's a place that African-Americans might be attracted to, but there are other natural areas like the Yosemite National Park, for example, which also has a, an African-American story behind it. And that could be a way to market and attract people. And that's one of the ones, that's the kind of a, a classic example. But it's also about, people seeing themselves, whether it's the experience that they'll get, like going to Yosemite or a, um, a Cape Hatteras National uh, Seashore or Cape Lookout National Seashore. But it's also about seeing diversity in the, in the staff, in the Ranger Corps, um, those who are managing the parks, as well as um, just feeling comfortable, just making sure that the, um, the park staff have I'll just say a good understanding of how to connect and relate to the visitors that they are there to serve. Awesome. We have another question. Um, it says, many of the microaggressions that you shared with us tonight that Black folks experience in green spaces mirror those that we sometimes see in cold spaces. Um, you mentioned the gap between Black folks who value nature versus those who visited national parks. Why is that? Um, based on your research, is this due to primarily microaggressions or are there other barriers of access? This, it relates to uh, socio socioeconomic barriers, which is kind of an income, transportation, that kind of thing. It can relate to a cultural or historic barrier, something I touched on tonight that was kind of the main, the main um, and that can be either the, the microaggression or it can be the large scale systematic institutional um, discrimination, um, both historic, but also in ways that the parks are currently, um, that might be currently managed. Um, and then too, there's a kind of a combination of, of factors because um, in some cases, um, more affluent people choose to go to, um, I'll just say, I'm not gonna pick on cruises, but more affluent people might choose a cruise over going on a trip to the Smokies. Um, and so income is not a barrier. So it just may be 
people making choices and it may just be how the agencies reach out and try to connect. But one, the one thing I just want to mention in, in the twist in my, I'll just say that one, one shift in my career has been early on, I was focused on understanding why people didn't visit parks. That was kind of the question I was trying to answer. And I think before I got into this job, when I was really doing research, I began to start to ask about the institutions and what institutions could do to change so they could better serve, particularly the public institutions, like the Park Service, the Forest Service, state parks, and et cetera. You know, how could they change to become more responsive and inclusive in their policies and practices? So, so really shifting it to them um, to, to be um, the, to them to develop the solutions versus having, putting that pressure and um, on individual, on individuals and, the, and on, the, uh, on the visitor side. Okay, uh, let's, it looks like we have one more, a couple more questions. Um, will the council be addressing access to nature at the neighborhood at the neighborhood level? I hope so. I'll say that quickly. I hope so because one of the things I like to say is that going to parks are, are great. I, I I encourage it. Going to the forest, uh, state parks, refuges, wildlife refuges, all that. I think it's great. But backyard nature is also great. Neighborhood nature is also great. And that's what people are around most every day. And so it's important that those environments are of high quality as well. So I hope, so I real, so that's something that I will, um, I guess, emphasize and, um, and really push in my role on that council. Yeah, then I think we might have one last question. Let me, uh... Um, thanks for sharing the book by Carolyn Finney, Black Faces in White Spaces. Um, I love the concept of working to construct environmental spaces in our own image through community or organizations such as Ebony Anglers, the Joy Trip Project, and Black Folks Camp Two. So the question is, do we, Dr. Floyd, do we really camp? <laughs> yes, we do, but it may not be in the numbers that, um, that other groups do. And um, we do, I mean, so the, the interesting thing is we find these little pockets of these uh, different groups and, I, and it's and they're showing up in groups like Black Folks Camp too. And there are other, there's this, uh, um, the National Brotherhood of Skiers, which might be more than 30 or 40 years old. There are a number of, of uh, I'm gonna call them affinity groups around activities that people have Black scuba divers is another one um, where people are engaged in the outdoors, but it's not so visible. And so the challenge is to make these visible, to show people that, well, to show everyone that these are not, as some people say, white spaces, that these are spaces for everyone. Everyone can participate. And one of the things I like about Earl Hunter is that part of his motivation and strategy is to make these spaces more diverse so that when you come, in your first time, you see that it's a diverse space and that you are welcome there. And that's on both, that's on a number of sides with anyone who's visiting, they see, uh, regardless of the background, they can see that um, this is a place where everyone can come and be uh, included and, and welcome and respected and safe. Yeah, awesome. So to, to sort of like going on with that question of like, do we really camp? Have you heard of the term glamping? Yes. Like, Yes. So does that count for us? Like, cause I'm very much a glamper. Like, that I'm very much, that like, counts. I don't, because... pitch, I don't pitch tents, and so like I'm, I'm so I'm wondering, does that count or does that not count? That counts. Um, okay. that counts. It does count, and and that's what Mr. Hunter would try to sell you. Um, if he was still selling <laughs> selling uh motorhomes or not, yeah motorhomes and campers, yeah, that's a good. That's a that. that speaks to a point that, you know, people can experience it in a, in a variety of ways. And there's no one way. Of course, we have to uh, protect resources. Um, so for example, tech, protect wildlife and water and uh, things like that. But um, there are, there's a diversity of recreation opportunities out there, ranging from urban to, um, to wilderness. 
Awesome. I think there's one more, qu one last question. Um, sorry, the chat is going off, so I'm trying to get to it. Okay, it says, um, NC State has a travel team that arranges trips to green spaces. Has your team considered a partnership? Repeat that. Um, NC State has a um, has a travel team that arranges trips to green spaces. Has your team considered a partnership? Oh, um, I will look into that. I'm not think. I don't think we're connected yet. Wolf trip. Oh yes. I don't know. If, I don't know how we're connected yet, but I will find out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was exciting, um, and you are getting kudos after kudos after kudos, which is which is understandable. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, um, Dean Floyd, this has been an amazing um, experience for all of us to listen and to learn about this. Um, everyone who is on, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, remember, if there's any, if there's anything the Alumni Association can do for you as an alum, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. Once again, this is this has been recorded, so you'll be able to find this. It will be sent out to those who who signed up to attend, and also it will be posted on our YouTube channel channel within the, within the coming few weeks. So again, thank you all for attending. And as always, go pack. Go pack.